Okay, so I was a bachelor last week. My wife was up taking care of our little two-year-old granddaughter. And so I taped a movie, The Sum of All Fears. Do you remember that one? The, based on the Clancy novel with Ben Affleck playing Jack Ryan and uh, Morgan Freeman was playing the CIA director or something. And... Uh, you got to love these things. I, I, you know, the, my favorite kind of movies are, you know, which wire do you cut at the last minute, you know? And so you re, those of you who saw the movie will remember, and those of you who didn't might want to plug your ears if you want to see it, but uh, ah, it's an old movie. If you haven't seen it by now, you're probably not going to. But anyway, the, the plot is basically that there's this uh, terrorist group, this uh, sort of neo-fascist um, group, what are those, uh, the triads or the tribunals where they have the conspiracy groups? You know, it's some sort of a neo-fascist, high-powered, wealthy group of people that, that are terrorists. And so they want to destroy, get Russia and the United States to destroy each other. And so they uh, are able to uh, detonate a low-yield nuclear bomb during a football game in a stadium in Baltimore in the United States. And so that sets the United States and Russia on this path to mutual total global annihilation. And so it, it, they keep making these different moves back and forth, and they immediately go to like DEFCON 4, whatever that is. And, uh, and then the United States president under the counsel of all of his generals, he initiates a thing called snap count. And what snap count does is it basically pulls the trigger, trigger on, on everything we have. You know, every, every ICBM, wherever it is in the world, is headed right into Russia. And so anyway, the entire world comes up to the, the brink of total destruction. And then some sanity comes into play and and they, uh, they begin to stand down and they agree to, to keep lowering the, the, the temperature on that until relations are normalized. And, and then they, you know, at the end of the movie, they hug each other and, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> great movie, great movie. And, and, but, but the idea is, is they, they bring the whole world to the brink. And... It's very similar to a lot of what happens in our own lives. Uh, this week, some of you have had controversies. Some of you have had situations that have brought you to the, the very brink, maybe not a total, total global annihilation, but certainly uh, the destruction of life the way that you've known it. And it might be in your marriage. Uh, it might be something that has been escalating for a while, or it might be something that erupted this week, and you're on the brink. Or it could be in your work life. A, a number of you are out of work. Probably a number of you are on the brink of some catastrophic work-related thing, and some of you have other kinds of issues as well. And so, uh, the text today that we're going to look at relates very much to this. You'll see it in a minute. First, uh, let's go ahead and do a shout out. Today we want to give a shout out to the men of Community Church of South Florida in Hallandale, Florida. There are 10 men that have just recently started meeting there and uh, they're doing the, the webcast Bible study. They're meeting on Friday nights from 8 to 10 and uh, so uh, at Dunkin' Donuts, or at least that's what they tell them their wives, and so, uh, and uh, Guillermo Delgado, big thank you to him. And he told me that you guys are getting ready to, to split into two groups too. So that's, that's exciting. And so uh, we want to welcome these men uh, into uh, the family. And so would you join me in giving a warm welcome to the men of Community Church of South Carolina. <laughs> And then we have uh, uh, some men who have also joined the family this, this week by uh, indicating that they're starting a uh, Man in the Mirror Bible study group. So uh, James Turns from uh, Indiana, Ross 
Corbett. I want to welcome these guys. Ross Corbett from uh, Cross Junction, Virginia. Uh, Isom Ramsey from Beaumont, Texas. Steve Lewis from Rockwall, Texas. Scott Mendez from Weatherford, Texas, pastor. Paul, I'm going to get this wrong, Paul. Uh, Chan Thalangsi. Chan Thalangsi from Rockford, Illinois. Welcome. Christopher DeLong from Lock Sheldrake, New York. Alex Cabrera from Oceanside, California. Gregory Williams from Lacey, Washington. Alvin Johnson from Portland, Oregon. John Risk from Washington, Michigan. Lawrence Smith from Beverly Hills, Michigan. And uh, my favorite, Dolph uh, from St. Joseph in uh, Dominica. So I looked up Dominica. That's just north of Martinique. Uh, road trip. Anytime. Let me know. <laughs> so uh, we'd like to welcome these men who are starting uh, Bible study groups. Okay. So uh, the, the title of today's message is this. How can you have confidence about uh, the will of God? We want to be at Matthew chapter, what is it, 17, verse 24. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. This is the third story in a row that focuses on the disciple Peter, which is kind of interesting. Matthew has chosen to, to focus on Peter, and he's actually telling a story here that none of the other gospel writers chose to repeat. Verse 24. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Well, what are we talking about here? <clears throat> the two drachma tax, two drachmas, equals about two days' worth of wages. And it was a tax that was part of the Mosaic law that was levied against every Jewish male 20 years of age and older once a year in order to provide for the upkeep of the temple in Jerusalem. So it's a religious tax. It's not a tax by the government. And frankly, there's, there's nothing similar to this uh, that I could think of that we actually uh, have in our culture today. It was very specific to, to the Jewish culture. But it's about uh, two days' worth of wages. Verse 25. Peter responds, Yes, he does. He does pay the tax. And when Peter came into the house, and by the way, my favorite place in Israel happens to be the city or the ruins of Capernaum. And there is a house there, which is the traditional site of Peter's home where, where this would have taken place. And you can go there. You can probably go. Well, actually, you can go online and uh, put in Capernaum and put Peter's house. And you can see the ruins of this, this house that they're talking about there, or at least the traditional site for it. It may or may not actually be the house. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked? From whom did the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own sons or from others or strangers? And Peter answered, from others. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. So what Jesus is saying is that the, 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 in, in the kingdom of God, he's talking about the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, uh, the sons of God, the children of God, you and I, those whom uh, our great God has lavished his love on, we're exempt from paying uh, these taxes. But then Jesus says in verse 27, but... So that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin, a stater. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so um, 
Where does Jesus want to take us today? Well, we have a situation uh, which it looks like has the potential to develop into yet another controversy for Jesus. Uh, whether or not Jesus is going to pay the temple tax. And uh, there have been many, many controversies already, more to come. And so Peter, Peter doesn't know how to handle this. Peter does not know God's will on this matter. He doesn't have the confidence to know what to do. And so he comes to Jesus, and, uh, and Jesus gives, you have to admit, a very peculiar response. But, but what does this mean to you? What does this mean to me in the way that we live our lives? And so I, I would just like to say that I think that the timeless uh, message here is something like this. What the, the message here is something like this. is that Sometimes it's preferable to do something that is unnecessary or not required in order to not offend, or at least to not necessarily offend. So uh, there's no requirement to do this thing, but so as not to offend people, Jesus goes ahead and tells them to do something that, that they don't really need to do. And it raises a lot of questions, though. You know, isn't this compromising your beliefs? And, 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 and where do you draw the line on these kinds of issues? Huge question. So here's the big idea for the day. Where the subject is, how can you have confidence about the will of God? And we've just been looking at today's situation in the scriptures. Here's the big idea. God's will for every situation is either decreed, prescribed, or not prescribed. And what I want to focus on mostly today, since the text is not so related, we're going to go up a couple levels in the outline. And I want to give you a tool today so that you can uh, do a more effective job discerning God's will and have confidence in, in God's will. So a tool to help discern God's will. You with me? Here it is. So remember, the big idea is God's will is either decreed, prescribed, or not prescribed. So I put those in whatever color that is. Uh, it looked yellow on the, uh, the thing I had. Oh, it looks yellow over there. It looks gold over here. Okay. So, <clears throat> who doesn't want to know God's will? Everybody wants to know God's will. So, everything about God's will uh, is either decreed or it's not decreed. Things that are decreed, there's no free will in those things. Well, what are some examples of the things that are decreed? Well, the, the Genesis 1, the creation of the heavens and earth, that is something that's decreed. Uh, uh, what, what color your, your eyes are, that's something that was decreed. Psalm 139, you knit together in your mother's womb. You had no, nothing to do with that. That was something that, that was decreed uh, by God. The, the first coming of Jesus Christ, that is not a matter of free will. The second coming of Jesus Christ, that's not a matter of free will. So there are the decrees of God. And then there are also things about your future that even though you have free will, uh, you will find yourself uh, going against, unwittingly, against the, the decrees of God. And, uh, and so that's why sometimes things we want don't turn out the way that we thought that they might. So there are the things that are decreed, and then there are the things that are not decreed. And this is where free will comes in, into, into play. And so, one thing that's confusing to a lot of people about God's will is they think it's they they, they t tend to have heard enough about it to think that it's either free will or it's not free will. Actually, depending on the situation, it can be a decreed or a not decreed situation, and so. If it's not decreed, it is something that you exercise your free will. Now, with regard to those things that are not decreed, we can, you, you can see that there are two choices. Things are either prescribed 
or not prescribed? What are some examples of things that are prescribed? Well, how about love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Love your neighbor, the Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, which is wrapped up in, 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 in the Golden Rule, the, the Great Commission, the Cultural Mandate. These are things that are prescribed in the Scriptures. And so our duty there is, in that case, when something is prescribed for us, is to use our free will to obey that which God has prescribed in the text. In fact, let's just, uh, we're done in this, this text here. Turn with me to John chapter 14, <clears throat> verse 15. When you're done today... You will not, uh, some of you, of course, already knew this before you got here. Some of you are seeing something like this for the first time. Most of you are somewhere in between. <clears throat> so I want to say you're probably not going to have fully wrapped your mind around this simple model by the end of this session, but you'll have it on paper. And here's why I know you will not have your mind fully wrapped around this because it took me 30 years to develop this chart. Okay, I didn't just whip this up this week. I've been working on this. I've been working on this all of my adult Christian life. And uh, it's only about two or three months ago that I actually uh, finally wrote, wrote, wrote it down exactly like this. And I've been, been working on it for a few months. So I'm unveiling this work of, well, actually, it's, it's, just, it's just what the Bible says, but... I guess I'm a little slow. Uh, it took me a long time to figure this out. So, uh, when things are prescribed, then you have two choices. Okay, that is God's prescribed will, and then you either obey or you disobey. And if you disobey, that's, that's sin. And then, I'm not talking about what you do when you uh, do it wrong here, when you do something simple. I'm just wanting to explain how you can more effectively have discern God's will and have confidence in discerning God's will. So then, uh, decreed or not decreed, prescribed or not prescribed, you can obey or disobey. If it's in this uh, not prescribed, however, then it can either be beneficial or it, <clears throat> it can be uh, not beneficial. Now, what are the kinds of things that are not prescribed? Well, that's almost everything you'll do today. <laughs> you know, which customers do you call on which phone calls do you return and not return? Uh, uh, bigger issues like uh, who do you marry? Uh, one, of our, one of our men has recently become engaged. God, God didn't prescribe the woman that uh, God didn't decree. that. Well, this is going to get very complicated very quickly. <laughs> very quickly. Very. <clears throat> so this would be a good point to mention that Deuteronomy 29.29 29 is always overarching this. And uh, so let's, uh, you've got your finger already at John 14. We'll come back to that. Keep your finger there. And let's look at this Deuteronomy 29.29 29, though. Because this is a, uh, this is a wild card. You'll recognize this, some of you, as soon as we repeat it. Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, that's way, way back at the beginning. And it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. And so there are, there are secret things of God. Isaiah 55, 9 says, uh, God, God says, uh, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. And so there are secret things uh, that have been decreed that we don't know that they've been decreed and we find out later. <clears throat> my father-in-law, I, I, I didn't really understand what he was trying to say when he told me this, when I first met him, uh, my, my wife is from uh, South Florida, so we went down, and it was the first time I, I met my potential in-laws at that, that point. And so the next morning at breakfast, my now father-in-law sat me down at the breakfast table just 
he and I, and he said, uh, said, you know, Pat, there's not one right woman for a man to marry. There are 10,000 women that you could be equally happily married to. And uh, so, but, you know, you, you, you meet one. I never really quite figured out if he was trying to run me off at that point or not. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> it, the woman you marry is not prescribed, nor is the job that you'll take or the college education you'll, you'll get or not get, whether you go to Votech or whether you're an engineer or um, uh, what house you buy. I mean, most of the things that we do are not prescribed. So if something is prescribed, our duty is obedience. If something is not prescribed, we're seeking wisdom. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the wisdom of God. And the Bible tells us that all things are lawful for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And so in these things that are not prescribed for us, we can make beneficial and we can make not so beneficial uh, uh, decisions. Uh, when we make a beneficial decision, that means that we have sought God in prayer. He's, 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 wanting, he's wanting us to seek and to find His will in the context of a reciprocal love relationship with Him. And then out of the overflow of that adoptive father-son relationship, he wants to bless us as we, as we seek his guidance and his counsel, just like you would seek the, the guidance and the counsel of your, your regular father, right? And so, so bottom line is that, uh, that we, want to, uh, we want to use wisdom and, and do that which is, is beneficial. But... Um, not everything is. Uh, not all of our choices are. Uh, some, some things we choose to do are, are not beneficial. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's sinful just because it's not beneficial. Um, there is this whole category. Uh, I li I'm, I've been thinking about this for some time. I'm going to talk to you about this on another day. But the whole category of doubtful habits. Uh, the, the vein of that is, as a sidebar, is that I think that one thing that might be possibly holding back spiritual revival and awakening in America is that the, the Christians uh, need to abandon their doubtful habits. Now, <clears throat> what, what I would say is that a lot, of, a lot of groups will make doubtful habits into something that God has prescribed. Don't go to R-rated movies. Okay, um, where does it say don't go to an R-rated movie in the Bible? It doesn't. And so it is not something that God has specifically prescribed, but many, many groups will set that up as a litmus test and actually say that that is sinful. Well, actually, what, what, what biblically, where it would be better placed in my understanding is that it would be over here in the things that are not prescribed and uh, possibly not beneficial. But it's a matter of uh, Romans 14 freedom. And so for one person, it might be beneficial, uh, not beneficial. For the other, it might, be, uh, it might be a neutral situation. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, <clears throat> let me give you an example of, of uh, one of my doubtful habits. I drive a little red sports car. And I drive it... I drive it too fast. I know I drive it too fast. And let me tell you when I drive it too fast the most. I mean, you know, you drive around town, and so <clears throat> this little sports car is like a, it's like a slot car. And so um, I'm driving along Fairbanks at 30 miles an hour, and I always go home, I turn on Cambridge, and I don't slow down at the corner. So I take the corner at 30 miles an hour. Well, uh, I've got a pretty good field of vision, but, you know, I, I suppose that there could be somebody on a bicycle around that corner who wouldn't be expecting somebody to go around that corner at 30 miles an hour. I know that this is a doubtful habit. Uh, I doubt that I'll do anything about it, but it's a, it's a doubtful habit. 
Uh, if I don't do it there, I'll find another road where I can do it. But anyway, <clears throat> I mean, it's like, it's like one of the few thrills in my life is being able to take a corner at high speed, okay? Give me a break. Can I, is, this, is there anything left that I can do as a Christian that's fun? <laughs> okay, so, so beneficial uh, things that are not prescribed that can either be beneficial or, or not beneficial. So, now we're at 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. And uh, Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command. And then in verse 21, he says, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And then in verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So, uh, on the things that are prescribed, you can see that obedience is the evidence of uh, of our love. Uh, If we don't obey... Jesus and the things he's already given to us, then how will he know that we love him? How will we know we love him? So we can obey or disobey on the prescribed things, on the things that are not prescribed, though, uh, who you're going to marry and all that kind of stuff. Uh, You can make a beneficial, uh, a wise decision or one not so wise. If you make a not beneficial decision, though, let's just say that you you don't use wisdom. You marry you marry a, a shrew. Okay? And, uh, you know, it happens. Uh, um, I probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, (laughs) Okay, another doubtful habit. So, uh, there you go. You you marry a person. You didn't use wisdom. You didn't go through any kind of premarital counseling. You just... You, you married out of lust, and, and so you're, now you're, you're married, all right? So <clears throat> now what you do, as a result of that, you have made a decision, and it is, it is God's will that you married that woman, even though it was not uh, decreed and not prescribed and not beneficial. Nevertheless, you'll notice it's still under the mantle of God's will. Everything that happens in this world is, is ultimately part of God's will. So you then need to uh, make a decision if you're, uh, or it could be you've taken the wrong job. So um, then you can make either a sinful choice or, or a righteous choice. Um, and you can imagine some of the things that would, would happen in a, in a relationship. Uh, by the way, if you are in a bad uh, situation marriage-wise, 1 Corinthians 7, it prescribes how you should handle your, the not prescribed, not beneficial marriage so that you don't do it in a sinful way. Read 1 Corinthians 7, and you'll get the prescription for the person who's in the not beneficial situation. So the Bible is, compl- uh, it is, com- it, it, it is comprehensive. It is comprehensive. There is not a situation that you will ever face uh, on which the Bible is silent. Never. You will never find a situation that you face on which the Bible is silent. Now, just... Uh, uh, we can't do it. We don't have enough time. Gosh, I'd love to. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this again in a few months, okay, and, and take another cut at it. That's the best thing to do. But you might want to just check out Romans chapter 14 for uh, this idea, because it, Romans 14 is talking about the idea of, uh, of uh, setting up things that we uh, eat. You know, one person eats meat, the other person thinks it's sinful. Uh, one pe- person eats uh, vegetables. Uh, another person um, uh, make, thinks one day is special uh, out of the week. Another person thinks every day is the same. And uh, some people drink wine, some people don't. And, and the whole idea is there 
is, is to give us enough confidence in God's will that we don't go and, and blow people away. And this is the situation that's happening in today's text. Jesus understood the will of God because he was God. He understood the will of God and he was confident enough that he didn't have to blow people away and escalate the controversy. He could, uh, as I said, the, sort of the timeless message uh, for, for the week is that sometimes it's preferable to do something that's not necessary so that you don't offend other people. And you can find that in that text in Romans 14. Again, today, God's will for every situation is either decreed, prescribed, or not prescribed. Just to wrap it up, Let's talk for a moment about having confidence not, not to offend. So, we would uh, want to locate the situation out of today's text about giving the two drachma tax. We'd want to locate that into the area that's not prescribed, and, but something that is benef- was beneficial to do. In many situations that you will find yourself today, uh, it will be better for you, it will be better for the kingdom of God if you make a compromise. Leadership is the art of compromise so that life can go on. It's, it will mean that you will not say that t- to your wife, which you are fully justified to say. Because she's using, she's jumping to a conclusion because of women's intuition, and there's no fact check, all right? And you know that, that what she's saying cannot be right. Shut up. Shut up. You can have the confidence not to offend because you can see the example that Jesus has set that it is not necessary to always set the record straight. Sometimes wisdom is to not do something that you you would be appropriate to do, but you do it so that you don't offend other people. Make sense? Big idea today. God's will... God's will for everything, every situation. It's either decreed or it's not decreed. And if it's not decreed, it's either prescribed or it's not prescribed. And so the situations that you face, you can use this as a filter for everything, everything. Locate your situation in this, in this model And then that will give you guidance on what you should do. Okay, is the issue obedience or disobedience? Or is the issue wisdom? Or is the issue doing that as something that is... uh, uh, You get the idea. Everybody out, let's pray. Our dearest Father, Lord, we we come to you humbly today wanting to have, wanting to know your will, wanting to have confidence that when we, we make a decision, when we take a step, that we, we are within, within your good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I pray, Lord, that you would use uh, this message today to give each of us a greater confidence in what we're doing. And then also, Lord, if there's something we are doing that we should stop doing that, that has been brought to light this morning, that you would, you would give us the, the moral courage through the power of the Holy Spirit to do that thing. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.